I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 is our text. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with us, whether you are in the room or online, whether you're at our Parker campus or at, here at Sweetwater, uh, I'm just going to encourage you to grab whatever is around you. Now, if you're at Sweetwater and you don't have a Bible, there's one around you. Grab that Bible. If you're in Parker campus, uh, there's Bibles at a table in the back. Run back there and grab one of those and turn to page 1084 and you will find our text for the day. Now, if you're here and you don't have a Bible, if you're in Parker and you don't have a Bible, then uh, feel free to take one of those Bibles with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will actually change your life. Now, if you're uh, joining us on our online campus and you don't have a Bible and you want one, please uh, just message us and give us an address. We will send a Bible to you, whether that is by sending a person uh, in Havasu or Parker or surrounding areas or whether it's mailing one to you. Again, we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because that is one of the ways that God unleashes His life-changing power for us. Now, uh, right now, our country is obsessing about health. Right? I, I don't know if you guys have noticed this or not, but the conversations have changed so that I don't usually I just ask people, hey, how you doing? But I go, are you staying healthy? You know, you ask people, are you staying healthy? Are you, are you healthy? Have you, have you, you know, been hit by COVID? Are you around people who had COVID? And, and, uh, and our country is just obsessing about health, physical health. And, and we talk about it all the time. It's everywhere. But let me ask you about, you know, kind of the pre-COVID approach that you had to health. So how many of you like going to the doctor? Yeah, nobody raised their hand. If you're watching online, in case you didn't raise your hand. So let me rephrase the question. How many of you schedule regular checkups to see a doctor? Okay, lots of hands in the room. If you're watching online, you got to raise your hands if there's other people there, okay? You guys got to join in and, and be a part of this. So uh, we visit doctors, Okay, most of us do this. Now, when you're young, you don't have a choice. Your parents take you to the doctor, and, and you get your shots, and they tell you how you're growing, you know, where you are in the charts, uh, you know, are you tall, are you short, or, or, you know, all this kind of stuff. Do you weigh a lot? Do you weigh little? It's the only time that people are excited about, you know, being at the top of the weight charts, right, when you're, when you're too young to understand. And, and then you get older, and, and you go to the doctor because you want to play sports, Guys, do you remember that awkward, you know, physical before you played sports, turn your head and cough kind of moments? You know, not, not really, uh, some people are like, I was trying to block that out of my memory. Thanks for bringing it up. And then, you know, after the, that kind of high school period, uh, I don't know about you guys, I didn't go to the doctor for a long time. Unless I was sick. If I was sick, then I would go to the doctor. But otherwise, I'm not going to the doctor probably for a couple of decades, and go to the doctor, and then I started getting old, right? Past 40, and they start saying, you should go have a checkup, and so you finally schedule a checkup, and, and, and you find out, okay, uh, I was healthy up until a few years ago, right? And then they go, hey, the, the blood pressure is kind of going up there. You need to lose some weight. Don't you like it when the professional calls you fat? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to, and, you know, and, and uh, because I, I didn't lose enough weight and give up caffeine, because there's caffeine in Diet Pepsi, uh, I got to start taking blood pressure medication, you know, to, to help that. But I never would have known that my blood pressure was high. I wouldn't have known that I was borderline on cholesterol and blood sugar. I wouldn't have known these things if I hadn't actually, you know, gone to the doctor and gotten a wellness check. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we do that to, to discover things that can cause harm because we don't want to be harmed by them. So today we're looking at an account of the early church. It's recorded in Acts chapter 4. We're actually going to do 4 and the beginning of 5. And, and uh, it demonstrates the health of the early church. This account, it's broken up into two kind of accounts in your Bible because those chapters and verses weren't inspired in the original. It's just was continuous thought. But it demonstrates the health of the church. And we can learn from this. We can apply it to our church, to Calvary. And uh, what I'm hoping is that you can listen to this and you can learn from it and apply it to your life and kind of give yourself a wellness check and see if uh, you're living kind of like the, the early church, the early followers of Jesus. Now, I, I share this. This only really applies if you're a Jesus follower. 
Okay, this only really makes sense and applies to you if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a personal commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Now, if you haven't made that commitment and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, then uh, listen in because you're going to learn kind of what we expect a healthy church and healthy people to look like according to the book of Acts. Now, I'm going to pick up and I'm going to read the end of chapter 4, beginning at verse 32. I encourage you to follow along, and we're going to pause at the end and talk about this. It says, Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet." Now, the first characteristic of wellness, of health, that we see in the early church was unity. Unity. The early church was marked by unity. I don't know if you picked up on this, but it says the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. They were together. Later on, it said they they had great grace among them. So uh, unity is a characteristic of a healthy church and of a healthy life. Let me say that again. Unity is a characteristic of a healthy church and a healthy life. And and that is essential for us to hear because we live in divisive times. Okay, I mean, they're divisive socially, they're divisive politically, they're divisive religiously. I mean, right now we're just in a time that is extremely divisive, but the truth is because of sin, really all times have been crazy divisive. We're, we're, We're always fighting about stuff. People are always fighting about stuff. And and you would think that it would be those people out there, people who don't know Jesus, people who aren't following God, people who don't understand him. But can I just tell you that churches and church people excel in division as well? Can we just be honest about this? I mean, I grew up Southern Baptist, which is like getting a a special, uh, you know, ops training in religious warfare. Uh, but, uh, But I grew up learning why we were right and why all the other churches were wrong. And I could argue about doctrine at a young age, but can I just be honest, that did not make me a joyful Jesus follower. And it didn't make the churches full of joyful Jesus followers either, and it showed because we were always arguing about something, whether it was you know, doctrine or whether it was how to you know, do anything in the church. Everybody was right, everybody had an opinion, and everybody wanted to fight about it. So uh, out of that background, God allowed me to be a pastor. And can I just tell you at Calvary, we want unity, not uniformity. Okay, we want unity, not uniformity. Uh, You know, uniformity is where everybody kind of feels the pressure to look the same, talk the same, dress the same, vote the same. Look, I want unity, not uniformity. I don't even care if you root for another team. All right? And since we're in Havasu, you know, there's, and Parker, people root for teams from all over the world. Uh, but uh, so we want unity. And you go, okay, well, everybody wants unity. What do you want unity in? We want unity in love and in mission. Okay, unity in love and mission. Uh, we're just following the lead of Jesus at this point. Because the great commandment, Jesus said, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. He said this is the first commandment greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's called the great commandment. Jesus said all the law and all the prophets hang on these two statements. Okay? Love God. Love people. It's a great commandment. So we want to be united in love. Our love for God, our our love for Jesus, and the fact that he's our Savior, our love for one another because um, we're supposed to love. And then the great commission. Right before Jesus ascended to heaven, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and I'm going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. 
Okay, great commandment. Love God, love people. Great commission. Go and tell them about Jesus. Make disciples of all nations, all people, everywhere. So we, uh, we want unity in love and in mission. Now, if you're like me and you're raised in a church that focused on being right about everything, some of you are going, okay, but what about doctrine? Because it matters. Yes, we teach doctrine. We, there's no insignificant doctrine, but at the same time, we identified five essential doctrines. Five essential doctrines that we will fight over. Only five. Okay, and by the way, if you want to know what they are, they're on our website. Okay, under the about. Okay, you can look them up, read them. Because I have yet to meet a Bible-believing follower of Jesus who had any issue with those five statements. None whatsoever. All different kinds of church backgrounds, and they go, yep, I can agree with that. I can agree with that. So check them out and see if you can agree with that. That's what we'll fight over. Otherwise, in everything else, we're going to listen to each other. We're going to learn from each other. We're going to respect each other's differing biblical interpretations. I mean, the church has been arguing about stuff for about, you know, 1,800 years. I don't think we're going to solve it all before heaven. Now, I want you to learn it. I want you to study it. I want you to have convictions. But I also want us to have unity in what? Love and in mission. Which means you don't have to agree with the person sitting next to you about when Jesus is going to come back. Is it going to be post-trib? Is it going to be pre-trib? Is it going to be the dispensation? How, how long are we going to be here for the tribulation? Are we going to escape it all? Are we going to live through it all? Look, have your opinion. Find out when you get there. Right? <laughs> Chances are you're going to die before it happens anyway. Yeah. You'll just be eating popcorn, watching from heaven. <laughs> Having a great time. You're not going to care. So, you know, can we, just, can we just do that? Look, we do this, we have this understanding because loving people and leading them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus is our agreed priority as the people of God. That's what we're going to do. And we're not going to stop doing it. So uh, let me ask you a question. Let me get this uh, down to the personal level. Are you, as a follower of Jesus, a unifier or a divider? Does your life promote unity or division? Do you bring people together or do you, you know, create separation in the groups that you're involved in? And, and I know some right now are, are having that argument in their head going, well, but preacher, you know, it's really important to emphasize this doctrinal purity. No, uh, that's not what I ask you. What I ask you is, are you uniting people or are you dividing people? Because Proverbs chapter 6, do you know that it actually says that God hates people who sow discord among the brethren? Strong word. The other word they use there is Abomination. That if you are a natural divider, and that's what you do with your life, you're dividing people, then you are an abomination in the body of Christ. God wants you to be a unifier. And, and we need to understand that unity in your life, unity in your family, unity with, in your circles is an indicator of health. But unity is only going to be possible when we care more about loving people than winning arguments. Unity is only going to happen when we care more about loving people than winning arguments. And in churches, unity occurs when mission takes precedence over preferences. So uh, the early church was of one heart and soul. They had unity. That's the first test of health. And the second characteristic of a healthy church, in a healthy church life, is generosity. Did you catch that? And there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. They shared with one another. And I know some of you read this text, and, and you, you kind of you know, get some heart palpitations. You get a little bit nervous. You start going, you know, some of those, some of those people are going to use this to argue for socialism, it is not an argument for socialism. You know why? They were sharing what they had with one another so that everybody had enough, and they were doing it out of voluntary generosity. 
They were doing, they, like, they were motivated by their love for their neighbor. They were not mandated by the government to do something. Look, when you're motivated by love for your neighbor, that's a beautiful thing. And that's what they were doing. They were, they were motivated. They said, oh, we want to be generous. We want to take care of people. Why were they so generous? I mean, do you ever think about that? This is crazy, radical generosity. And you go, why were they so generous? Look, they understood that God owns everything. These were Jewish people. They were raised on the Old Testament because to them it was just the Testament, right? There was no new yet. So they were raised on that. They knew that the Psalms 24 says the earth is the Lord and everything that's in it. It's all his. The Apostle James, who happened to be there as part of this group, Jesus' half-brother who wrote the book called James, chapter 1, says that every good and perfect gift comes from God. Every single one. Look, they understood. This is all God's. He owns it. And they believe that God gave them those resources for a purpose. And by the way, that purpose isn't just so they could be selfishly comfortable. He gave them the resources for the kingdom because they, they wanted to bless the kingdom. And then, of course, they lived knowing that they were going to reap what they sow, including generosity. I mean, Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I mean, that's kind of blunt. So let me give you a picture to think about when it comes to generosity. Because again, this is radical generosity and most of us are not comfortable if somebody's challenged us to live like this. But here's, here's the picture I want you to see when it comes to biblical generosity. Uh, God made us to be rivers, not reservoirs. God made us to be rivers, not reservoirs. See, a river connects, it delivers, it brings life, it's moving. A reservoir saves, stores, holds, it's stagnant. A river is a natural pipeline of water. A reservoir is a storage tank. Now, a reservoir can be extremely useful if it has outlets. <laughs> you know, like Havasu is a reservoir. It was created by people to be a reservoir. But um, it has a purpose beyond just, you know, being enjoyed, right? It delivers water through man-made rivers to Southern California and Central Arizona. That's the purpose of that reservoir. It was created with that purpose, and that purpose is fulfilled as, you know, millions of people get water out of Lake Havasu in those very distinct regions. And, of course, it's a natural river that continues to run to Parker and Yuma and into Mexico. So it has a purpose because it has outlets and serves a purpose. It's healthy. Do you know what a reservoir without outlets looks like? It's called the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea in Israel. It's just full of salt. Nothing grows in it. They got some like these microscopic organisms that are in it. That's like they're all excited about that. But uh, see, the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. And there's no outlets. And it's dead. It's dead. Now, they're mining it for all kinds of, you know, minerals and stuff. So, you know, they're making money off of it. But it, it doesn't have life because it doesn't have outlets. Um, if you simply hold, save, keep, you become toxic and die. It's soul death. Uh, let me ask you a question, and, and it may be one that you and God need to talk about all week long. Are you living as a river or a reservoir? Are you living as a river or a reservoir? Which one are you more like? Is your focus on transferring blessings to others or is your focus on storing blessings for yourself? Because if God owns everything and God gave it to you, he gave it to you for a purpose. Now, I ask you that because uh, this is a tough conversation to have with God. I'm just going to be really blunt. It's a difficult conversation to have with God because... It's hard to be honest with ourselves. I know this from surveys. Uh, I think I shared this before, but 80% uh, of Americans identify themselves as generous. But only 60% of Americans give anything at all to charity. 
There's kind of a disconnect there, isn't there? 20% uh, of Americans are liars. <laughs> okay, now, that, that just, they're like, I'm generous. What do, you, who do you, what do you give to? What charity? I don't give to charity. I'm just generous, you know, to myself. I don't know. Uh, now, you think, okay, that's the world. That's people who don't know God, but let's take it in a little bit closer to home. So among, again, average American evangelicals, so we're talking about people who believe in Jesus as Savior, who believe uh, the Bible is the Word of God, churchgoers, people who are regular, people like those of you in the room, those of you who are tuning in, um, the average American Bible-believing Christian gives less than 3% of their income to any charity, including church. Hey, just uh, out of curiosity, do you know what, uh, what does God ask for obedient giving? Okay, some people said it. 10%. 10%. If you didn't grow up in church, you may go, why 10%? But, you know, it's because we use that Old Testament thing again uh, as, a, as a standard. So if the beginning point for generosity, obedient generosity, is 10%, and, and the average of what we give is less than 3%, we may be lying to ourselves a little bit. Because we can slap the label generosity on us, but uh, if God doesn't agree, it doesn't do any good. It's not a sign of health. And God's calling us to be healthy. He, he wants us to live as a river, not a reservoir. Now, I just want you to know, Calvary as a church is committed to generosity. We give 20% to mission causes. So when you drop a dollar in the offering box, we give 20% of that away right off the top. No questions asked. Last year, you guys gave over $750,000 to mission causes to change lives around the world. See, I think that's cool. You know, when I, when I go hang out with other preachers, I, that's some of the stuff I have to brag about. But, uh, <laughs> hey, but it's not just like we're sending the money overseas. $170,000 of that went to bless the communities of Parker and Lake Havasu. I mean, right here at home, you're helping people who need help, you know, just with, with life, navigating life. So, see, we believe that God created us to be a river of blessings, and we believe that generosity is an indicator of health as a church and in our lives. Okay, so we've got unity, we've got generosity as indicators of health. I don't know how you're doing on the test for your health so far. The third one, third test, third characteristic of a healthy church or a healthy life is integrity. And the story continues. Now, I, I want you to realize that the story continues, literally continues. There's not a break. There's not another chapter. This is not a, a, you know, a pause in Scripture. So I'm going to read the end of four and go right into five. So Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Now, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And when the young man came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. I love verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church <laughs> and upon all those who heard these things. <laughs> you think? Great fear. Um, okay. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard that story before or read that story before or wondered about that story, but it is a crazy story. Okay, basically, God killed two Christians for lying. And some of you are like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'm really in trouble. 
Now, I don't know about you, but it, it, you know, it begs the question, why? It kind of seems harsh, doesn't it? And the answer is, God takes integrity seriously. Crazy seriously. Now, understand, yes, they were lying. But it goes way beyond that. They were lying publicly, and they were lying in order to receive acclaim and gain leadership in the church. Okay, that's why I, I, the chapter 4 and 5, it, it's a continuous thought. Barnabas sold, uh, you know, property, came in, gave it to him, and, and, you know, and the reason that that's a big deal is because Barnabas became a leader of the church. He became a teacher in the church. He's one of the apostles. He was the first missionary of the church. That's a big deal. He gained influence. He gained respect. He gained position because he was a servant. Ananias and Sapphira, they saw that and they went, hey, we can score here. Let's sell our, you know, this piece of property we're not using. Of course, we, let's put some of it in our 401k. Let, let's, let's roll some of it over here, but let's take it and pretend that it's the whole amount. Let's pretend it's the whole amount because we want that status. We want that recognition. We want people's applause. We want to be leaders in the church, but we also want a nest egg. Uh, and so the church is brand new and the church is growing like crazy and God was protecting the integrity of the leadership of the body of Christ. He was not going to let somebody worm their way in who was a hypocrite. And the reason why is because God hates hypocrisy. Jesus hates hypocrisy. I mean, have you guys ever read the Gospels? Jesus is always running into these guys called the Pharisees and the scribes. And the Pharisees and the scribes were the most religious people of the day. They were the ones who, who literally were, were uh, the elite religious people that everyone looked up to and said, wow, they're holy. They're the, they're the ones who know the law. They're the ones who follow the law. If I could do that, that'd be great, but I can't do that, so I'm a sinner and they're not. They had the status. They had the respect. And Jesus pissed them off. Like to no end. Just over and over and over again. Because Jesus wouldn't follow their religious rules that were not biblical. I mean, remember, Jesus is the one who inspired the biblical commands. And these guys just had made a mockery of them. And Jesus, you want to read anger in, in print. Matthew 23 is the woes to the scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus just goes off on them, and he calls them hypocrites over and over and over and over again because they were pretending to be something they were not. And Ananias and Sapphira were pretending to be something that they are not. And Jesus repeatedly condemned hypocrisy, and he wasn't going to let it take root in his church. You see, a healthy church and a healthy life is marked by integrity. That's why character is one of our core values here at Calvary. We believe you cannot represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. And I say that, and yet hypocrisy is so easy to step into for all of us. Okay, I was a, I was a youth pastor early on, uh, young, and, uh, and everybody was like, yeah, you can't let those kids listen to secular music. And so I was like, look at the kids and go, you can't listen to secular music. Can't listen to it in youth group, can't listen to it when we go on trips, and you shouldn't be listening to it any time in your life. You should only listen to Christian music. And, and man, I was, I was on that, and I was beating that into them. And one day, I was listening to the Beach Boys. <laughs> right? And really enjoying it, and the Holy Spirit said, hey, why is it okay for you to listen to the Beach Boys? And I repented. I still encouraged them to not listen to secular music, but it stopped being a hard and fast rule because I realized that it's more important for us to live out integrity than it is to try and prevent the poisoning of some kids' minds. Um, so allow me to be really blunt. Money's not going to buy you influence at Calvary. Okay, first of all, I don't know who gives what. Never have, never plan to. So if you tell me how much you give, I'm suspicious already. 
might even be skeptical. Um, so uh, money doesn't buy you influence at Calvary. Status, position, education doesn't gain you influence at Calvary. Bible knowledge, church background, you know, titles and stuff doesn't gain you influence at Calvary. You, you know what gains you influence at Calvary? How you treat other people. Because that great commandment thing we take really seriously. Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. So how you treat it? Are you loving towards other people? Are you a servant? Do you live out humility? Do you consider others as important as you? Uh, what gains you influence is, is, are you encouraging or influencing anybody to follow Jesus? You know, if our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, then if that's not happening, then we got a problem. I, and I've been told by people, well, I'm much more interested in discipling people and teaching them than I am in, in leading people to Jesus. And I, I just go, I'm sorry, I don't want you to teach anybody then. Because if you're not influencing anybody to follow Jesus, then I don't want, you to, I don't want them to be like you. Because isn't that what you're doing when you're discipling somebody, is telling them you should be, follow Jesus like I'm following Jesus? It, what gains you influence is how you live out the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Look, is there love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in your life? If so, then I'm going to respect you. That, that's reality. Because that's integrity. Integrity matters to Jesus. It's a sign of health. And yes, because all of us fall into hypocrisy, because all of us are guilty of it from time to time, we really celebrate grace around here because we all need grace. See, the good news is Jesus forgives us every time we repent. So that's our wellness check. As a church, we're always striving to grow in unity, generosity, and integrity. So how did your checkup go? Because God is calling you to unity and generosity and integrity as well. Uh, now, if you looked at your health status after the message and went, I'm really not healthy, the good news is Jesus can change your life. All you really have to do is ask him and surrender, and he will do it. And if you've never yet started to be a follower of Jesus and now you're thinking you want to, then you can begin right now. Just surrender and ask him to change you. Let's pray. Father, you are good. And we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that, that you are the one who can, who can redeem our lives, our brokenness, our hypocrisy, our failures, our rebellion. You're the one who can give us a fresh start. And you're the one who, who doesn't look at us because of our failures, but you look at us and see the holiness of your son, Jesus. And for that, we praise you. But God, you're always calling us to follow better. You're always calling us to, to hear you clearer. You're always following us to surrender more. So right now, we come to you and we ask that you would help us to fully surrender because we want to be healthy people of God who are calling this world to a, to a, a hope that is real, to a life that has changed, and to a promise of eternal life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.